Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chelsea Neal, and I'm the Director of Federal Government Relations for the Equipment Leasing and Finance Association. On behalf of ELSA, it is my pleasure to introduce today's web, today's uh, summer software webinar series, Vendor Financing Research-Based Digital Experience. Next slide, please. Today's session will be recorded and it and will be available later this week. If you have any questions for our speakers, please type it into the question panel. We will leave time for Q&A after the presentation and address as many questions as possible. Next slide. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. Joining us today is Sean Birch, Director of Product Management from Northfest, uh, Terrence Nealon, Interaction Designer at CIT, and Melissa Osborne, VP of Digital Platform Director at Huntington National Bank. Speaker files are available in the handout panel. And Sean, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're glad to have you here. So we wanted to talk about vendor financing and research-based digital experience. And so we're happy to have Terrence and Melissa join us for this. So guys, um, even before we get started, so why is this important? Like, why, why is it important to have a digital experience for your vendors? And what are some of the tools that you guys have used to capture this? Well, um, essentially, you have to consider the, um, the vendors, uh, in many cases, uh, have a choice of who they want to work with. And so um, if your portal is considerably harder to use than your competitions, um, you know, the, the folks who are on the front line may end up choosing it uh, less often than a com competitor who's easier to work with. Velocity is a major factor in customer satisfaction. And the same is true for folks who work on the, on the floor. And uh, if uh, they're struggling to uh, get documentation and to get deals done and to, um, you know, complete their tasks and, you know, get the KYC, you know, logged and, and get, be ready for compliance, um, the operational costs will be very, very high and they'll, they'll choose someone else to work with potentially. Yeah, I completely agree with Terrence and I would add that because vendors have so many options, um, each transaction is an opportunity to continue to win their business. So really starting to understand your vendors and um, where they are in their digital journey and how you can help them along is going to continue to bring success. All right, thanks, Melissa. One, one of those in, important tools is voice of the customer, just like you mentioned, right? So hearing what the vendors have to say and what's important to them and what do they like to see and what do they not like to see. Mm -hmm. And another key word here is minimum viable products. So what can you guys tell us about that and voice of the customer? Well, Interestingly, I, I think Melissa and I are both at um, similar uh, at at slightly different stages of a project, but that when we tell you about them, we'll kind of give you a sense of the the, the life cycle of a of a development um, of vendor portal features. So uh, at CIT, we're in the process of of doing some discovery work for our new for a new um, vendor portal, and. Uh, the um, the initial set of interviews we've done about 65 or 70 each about 30 to 45 minutes long um, just intending to find out you know operationally what are the pain points um, where are people having trouble also it's important to realize like the people who've worked in the past and building infrastructure for your company may have built things that are really good so you have to find out what's working as well as where the challenges are um, so that when you release a new version, you don't obliterate something that um, that people really like. So this is still at the at the conversational level, um, and you, you kind of realize like when you're that you're starting to get to the level you want when you start hearing about problems that you've never heard about before and didn't even imagine before. And then once you gather that information, that's the stage that Melissa's at, uh, and she can tell you what do you do with all that, all those findings once you gather them. Right, and really it's so important to understand what is a day in the life? You know, how do they interact, um, whether it's with you um, as your financing partner or with their customer, um, so that you can take what you've heard as a part of that interview and go back and create some different things, whether it's a prototype, whether it's screenshots, and 
really try to take the feedback you've received and turn it into something actionable. And then have an opportunity to meet with them again and walk through, this is what we heard you say, um, and give them another opportunity to continue to provide feedback. And then also say, well, I might have said that, but this is that's not what I meant. I meant something completely different. Um, and really start to create that, that relationship um, about the digital process and about how can you create a repeatable process where they feel like they're being heard and then they're, they're seeing the actionable items that are coming out of the interviewing process. Great, thanks guys. Yeah, and as, as we were going to build out our vendor portal at, at North Tech called Aurora, we did the same thing. We, we interviewed vendors and got their feedback. And um, just to show you guys some of the, the feedback that we got was, you know, we want it to be intuitive and user friendly. And that was like the main thing is like you guys said, there's a choice for what they do. So we wanted to make sure that as you go into a system, it's easy to use the menus in the same spot that you would think it's going to be in. And you have you know, their intuitive names, the buttons and the frequently used tasks, those are front and center. So that you get, you log into the system, you can see exactly what you're going to do, whether that be to create a quote as a vendor or to create a new application. And then um, putting components on the page so that it's, it drives action and it's easy, it looks intuitive. They all oh, look, there's a button that I can click and that's, you know, it does what you think it's going to do. And then in addition to that, having a similar user experience on mobile compared to on your desktop so that you, you know, everybody wants to work away from their desks today. So being able to take that with you and be able to use your mobile device the same as you would use your device uh, at your desk so that you have a consistent user experience. So now that we're, we've talked about like getting the voice of the customer, um, we talked a little bit about enabling the vendors and what, what does that mean and like what kind of functionality would you want to see that helps enable the vendors especially from a digital perspective well um this is the kind of thing that that turns up uh as soon as you start um doing those customer interviews and and showing prototypes to people like melissa was saying um they fall into a lot of categories having a good search for example that kind of utility is really great other things fall into the bucket of what we would call accelerators. So these are things, these are features where you can click on a particular item, you know, an existing contract and create a renewal or an upgrade, um, really, really simply um, converting a quote uh, into an application um, really, really easily uh, without a lot of rekeying, which is A, faster and B, minimizes errors. Um, yeah, as you do your interviews, though, and you get deeper into the operations, the, you, you get when you get to the right level of granularity, you start also realizing things um, that are potentially issues that you didn't really know about. For example, like a, a really aggressive timeout can um, cause people to have to re-log in a lot, and that slows them down, and is also very, very frustrating. Um, so things like that that you can determine through careful research um, you know can can really really make a huge difference in the overall user experience but in general if you're looking for you know a headline you know a, an ultimate guideline for this i'd say um, take advantage of the fact that this you're using a computer let the computer programmatically do what it's really really good at doing you know you know filling out records without errors as opposed to you know just ha having the, the human component and having the work fall in the human component, use the computer. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I would add to that, that this is about creating a partnership and making sure that not only do you understand what your own internal processes are, but also what are your processes for your vendor and what are they going through with their end customer and how can you um, provide access to information at a critical point in time um, for your vendors, for example, or how can you enable them to um, get deals off of their street faster? And so it's about um, not only what can you do from a digital point of view and how can you have the, the um, processes work for you, not against you, but how can you also get them better access to information sooner and faster to um, help streamline their own processes as well? Yeah, exactly. And 
Yes, you're just you're speaking to me as a software vendor, right? Like letting the computer do what the what the computer can do. So terms like OCR, machine learning, artificial intelligence, those those are super interesting to me, and it's it's awesome to be able to see how you can put those in place to enable your vendors to do business faster, to get deals off the street faster. One of the ways that we were able to do that at North Tech was to uh, incorporate that OCR technology to the invoices. So provide the ability for a vendor who maybe is working with a specific manufacturer and they can have invoices to take that invoice, just drag and drop it or, or use your file upload to pull that in, take that invoice data, use some fun OCR machine learning technology and create an application automatically for them. So now you've enabled them to quickly enter in that transaction and not have to do any data entry for something that somebody's already done. So letting the computer do the thinking for you. And obviously you'd want to do that on a mobile device as well. So you could, you know, use your phone to take a picture maybe of an invoice that you have at your desk. So maybe you don't have any scanning technology or somebody didn't send you that nice PDF. So you could use your phone, pull it up, snap a picture of your, your latest invoice, and then it's going to do the same process that you would see on the computer. You got the slides to switch. All right, so Melissa, you mentioned giving access, giving vendors access to your data. Your data. Um, I, even as a vendor, I, I hear, you know, the vendors want to know what's going on with my deal. So I'm sure you guys get that question a lot. Right, absolutely. And it's not just about each transaction um, or an individual transaction. It's, a, it's about what's going on in my portfolio that I have in totality with you. Um, you know, what's my book of business with you um, as my financial partner? And so, you know, we hear a lot about um, not only just statuses on deals and what's happening, um, because that's always critical, but things like payments and delinquencies and how is my customers doing? You know, we, they've entered into an agreement. Um, we have a lease with you, but, but what's happening? Are they making their payments? Are they on time? Are they headed towards delinquency? And if I hear about it in advance as a vendor, can I help? Can I um, work with my customer and you um, to, to create um, something, a more beneficial uh, arrangement? Or can I help find you know, a, a different customer if we do head down towards a delinquency path? So um, you know, it's really important to them um, to have this information at their fingertips and available to them uh, throughout the life of, of deals as well. Yeah, in our research, we found exactly the same thing. Um, it's, it's kind of spooky, actually, how many commonalities we we found while we were both researching the same thing in different populations. Um, as you do this more granular, as I was saying, as you do this more granular research, as you as you dig closer and closer or deeper and deeper down, um, you start to really get a feel for what the operations are people are contending with and um, so when you when you bring the vendors in to the picture we started noticing this thing that we call the proxy swivel so just to take a step back a swivel is what we call it when um, I need certain information and I'm working on my main system say you know uh, you know my accounting system or whatever, but I need something that's not there So I have to swivel to another Computer system log in and, and go find the information there Sometimes I have to combine the info from those two places to do what I need to do So when you bring the vendors into the picture or a third party such as a customer as well we get something that we call the proxy swivel which is um, sort of I think it's kind of like the dark matter of the leasing relationship, right? Like it's hard to put your finger on where this, how this, how this manifests itself and what it does. But hear me out. So when the customer applies and they want to know what's the status of my deal, it's been a couple of days. What's going on? Um, the, if the vendor can't answer that question right away by checking their instance of Salesforce or some other system they then have to um, call somebody at the company. And that is not a call anybody was expecting. And now the person at the company is now, they've been proxy swivel, right? So they now have to stop doing whatever they're doing and go find out. 
So this is, I was saying this is the dark matter, right? Because this isn't usually tracked anywhere. There's no job code for this. This is just kind of, you know, extra work that has to be done. But in, unless you have a system that shows the status, right? And if they can go to a, a portal and see exactly what team is working on the deal and know how many stages are left, then um, that phone call and all of its associated work goes away. Right. I think you hit on a key point there, Terrence, of it's not just what status they're at, but what's left, too. I think that's also critical, and we hear that a lot. You know, where am I? One of what? Step one of five or three or four, whatever. Yeah, that's a, a common question I've heard from people, too. It's like, how do I give my vendors access to more information so that, you know, really so they don't call us, so they can, they can self-service themselves? And I mean, obviously you want to keep your human touch, but that's something that's super helpful in order to give them access to that. Um, yeah, well, so what we find is that the, the human touch is, is, is best saved for, like you don't run out of opportunities to tackle important problems. You have more time to tackle important problems because you're spending less time tackling trivial ones. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's a really good point too. Like, Letting the systems do what they can do so that you guys can focus on your human elements, right? Right. Right. So one of, one of the ways that we want to try to enable that at North Tech is to give the vent to give the lenders tools to give data to their vendors. Right. So giving them things like a data extract so that if they have like a customer list, they can pull that out. Or if like if the Lincoln sees under aging like Melissa was talking about, pull those out so they can pull those into their CRM if they're not using this as a CRM so they can see what the data looks like and do some analysis on their own. Um, another common theme that we've had is, I don't wanna to have to go ask for what's, what's the status of my deal. Wouldn't it be nice if the system told me, like sent me an email or a text message to do that? So we wanted to put, build something like that into our system too, so that you can set it up and you only get the ones that are important to you. And you get you know, texts if that's your thing or emails if that's your thing or both, if you wanna just really get you know, pounded with data. Uh, but you can set it up so you can get it daily uh, or get individual items and then you know making sure that you're informed as, as deals are, are progressing through the system and lastly what we wanted to do was incorporate reporting so not just data extracts but giving you some dashboards to look at so you know what's going on um, how are my deals looking by status how much have i funded this month uh, who is waiting for me and who am i waiting for what are those specific deals you can drill in both but just doing our best to help you lenders enable the vendors to spend time where it's important to you guys. This is an interesting one. So one of create efficiencies, and we've been talking about creating efficiencies for the vendor, but what does that mean to the lender as well? So creating efficiencies on both sides of the table there. Right, and that's really around, you know, automation. So I think, Terrence, you mentioned earlier, how can you, you know, have the, how can the, you have the computers do the work for you? How can you digitize as many processes as possible? Um, you know, how can you combine things like data collection with process automation? Um, you know, I think everyone is familiar with credit automation and how can you automatically call out to credit bureaus and bring back, um, you know, the scores and, and then how can you ingest that so that you can get to decisioning faster? Um, but just to implement that alone, I think saves you time and, and money. And when you think about the competitive environment that we talked about a little bit earlier, knowing your, your um, vendors' processes and how you can make things more efficient for them, and then combining that with making your internal processes as efficient as possible and automating different steps along the way, is really going to help improve um, not only your own internal processes and get from step one to five faster, but also for your vendors as well, because ultimately it's about getting those decisions out faster and automating every step along the way so that you can have that fast and easy and um, really excellent experience for your vendors and their customers as well. Um, Melissa covered that so well that I don't really have a lot to add, except <laughs> I, can, I can kind of bring in a, uh, an example. So when you start 
grounding your development process in research, right? And you begin by by building, you know, a really clear picture of what's happening in this operation, um, and when do things get messed up, and 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 you know, how what are the hidden brick walls out there that people are going to run into? Um, for example, um, you, you might find that you're working with an industry where um, they have ways of doing things that don't necessarily align with a, a digital um, a digital experience or digital application at at first glance. Um, the nice thing about the digital application, of course, is it's very flexible. You can alter it to accommodate uh, re real real world processes that you know in some cases you don't have a hope of changing. So. For example, you know, in some industries, uh, you know, in some of our research, we've turned up that um, the person who might have filled out the application um, is not necessarily the person with signing authority. Um, and so while everybody likes eDocs, or almost everybody, and, and certainly they're, uh, they're an efficiency uh, win and, and are um, much easier and, and less likely to get lost in paper documents, if you never capture the email of the signer um, in the process, then that uh, signing, that point, the point of the process where you want everything to get signed is going to just suddenly stop while everybody figures out what to do. So during our research, we realized that in some industries, you know, we're going to need to, to make a tiny change, which is simply add the signer's email so that they can get the, the e-doc packet. Um, as opposed to somebody else, because you know, you guys know you, you can't forward these things; it, it messes it up completely. So um, it's it's research like that that lets you deliver that that result that Melissa was talking about, where the operations are are programmatically fueled to the extent that you can, where um, you don't even make errors because you know your your the computer is using correct information. You know that's the state you want to get to. Right. Right. Absolutely. I think. You know, we both, it was funny, we both had that same example um, where if you just ask for some information earlier, then the whole process streamlines itself um, throughout by using, you know, for we had this same example where um, we made sure to know who's the signer um, because it might be someone different and then that automates the whole document process for us. And, and so sometimes it's just that little extra tweak throughout your own internal process to ask a question in a different place. And, and that was one of the things that we've done um, as well to understand what are the steps internally as well as externally with our vendors. And if we ask questions at a different point in time, can we be faster? Can we be more efficient? Which also then turns around and helps our vendors be uh, efficient as well. Yeah, we, we found we can even do this in the same, within the confines of the same process. So mm -hmm. let's say someone's filling out an application and during that application, you know, they might be on step three. And at that point, they've already entered a couple of different addresses. You know, they might have entered a PG address. They might have entered one or more, you know, location addresses. Um, so now we're going to ask them a question of, you know, to determine, uh, you know, maybe a, a third location that that may be an equipment location or something as opposed to like a home address or a business address. You can feed back those um, previously captured addresses on the screen, speed up the process. Nobody has to rekey anything. They even, you know, you don't even run the risk of, of, of them making an error rekeying something they just entered a minute ago. They can just click, yep, this address is the same as that one and they move on. And it's that kind of thing where you, where you can really, um, you know, say, you know, a few seconds saved every time, you know, the, the, you know, the velocity improvements are always valuable and helpful. That just reminds me of what we're going to talk about in the next slide, but I just wanted to touch on it real quick, like just stuff from other industries, like being able to, like, if we're, as a consumer, I'm going to a website or whatever, it's gonna autofill for me. I should be able to pick from the addresses like that. Yeah. Just being able to translate those into the systems, I think is a, is a good, good point. Mm -hmm. So on the create and efficiency side, Melissa, you mentioned like automating docs and mm -hmm. uh, processes like that. 
and then just putting like digitizing what you can digitize. Like one of the ways that we've done that uh, with our products is this checklist, like digitizing the checklist and then making it so it's integrated between the lender system and the vendor system so that you're able to just drag and drop a file like that if you needed a picture of a driver's license or avoid a check so that it shows up in the system. Somebody doesn't have to like track an email or like scan something. And then being able to do that with like your phone again, like being able to take a picture of whatever it is and then attach that into the system so it's digitized, you don't lose it and you're not wasting time trying to go find stuff. Mm-hmm. And then same concept with digitizing the docs, being able to request your docs in the system so that you don't have to rekey information. You're just taking the data from what was approved saying, yep, this is all accurate. This is the right payment. Can you send me my docs? And then getting those back within the same system so that that stuff just making everything so much faster and increasing your velocity and enable them to get more deals off the street and do more deals faster. Okay, so now I'll actually talk about the voice of the, our um, voices from other industries and what you know what do you guys see in there? One of the things that we we've been doing at North Tech and when we sit around and brainstorm and stuff is thinking about all right, what do I what do I do like mortgage industry or like your your credit card industry or things like that? Like what's what's interesting from there that you'd like to see pulled into equipment finance industry and starting to you know catch up to that and to, to the other industries in your your personal life too. Mm-hmm. Well, the um, the uh, the key point here, I think, is that is what you said is people go home, right, and they pull up their web browser and they're exposed to fantastic digital experiences, um, and so there's inherently going to be a comparison in their heads. So how come this search doesn't work as well as Google's and I mean, if you're a developer, you know why, but you know, from a user experience perspective, it really, it's, it's, it's absolutely going to be asked. So the, there is a, is a pressure there um, to, to meet parity with other experiences that people may be encountering. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, that's a lesson that can, you can overgeneralize from or over, uh, you know, or, or set really high expectations from, for example, like, Preparing a lease quote for a customer is is never going to be as exciting as specking out, um, you know, a Porsche or a BMW, right? A, a sports car is just more fun. However, um, there is a um, there are lessons to be learned here. Um, you know, the um, depth of uh, the experience that uh, you get when you're able to pick paint colors and see full lush photography of interiors and change options and and then immediately um, go and find out where in your zip code you can you can buy the car that you picked out. I mean, think about the deep understanding that you're building of what that customer wants in a very short and efficient time, and then connecting them to where they can go and get that exact thing. This is something that any industry can learn from. And I think um, uh, you see, for example, like how would, so how would you translate in, in that into a leasing experience? You know, you'd wanna think about, you know, really nailing down what the customer's needs are right away. You know, maybe sending them multiple options for quotes, even if they didn't specifically request them. Uh, if you have the option to connect them to approved vendors uh, in their in your area that sell the same thing that they do, like try to figure out what would be the next big thing that the customer would want and see how close you can get to to providing that. Um, so uh, you know it, it it shouldn't just stop with like here's a quote. You know there's always more that that, that you can layer on. I just want to um, sort of amplify that just a little bit because I, I see we're doing pretty well on time. Uh, <laughs> so when you start creating a feature like that, if you're the first person who has this, you know, incredibly awesome quote, you know, builder experience in the country, well, two things are going to happen. One is that everyone else is going to start to copy it, which is inevitable, and there's nothing you can do about that. And what as that is going on. This feature is going to is going to change from a cool surprise and delight type feature, and it's going to start to become um, expected over time. Mm-hmm. You know, not, no industry is stands still forever. Um, they do they they 
aren't really industries anymore, they're just history. So we have to consider, right, where are the, what, what features are becoming considered um, absolute necessities that used to be the sort of surprise and delight type features. The best example of that is voicemail. You know, a few decades ago, voicemail was, con answering machines were considered like weird and unusual. And now if somebody doesn't have voicemail or call waiting, like you might not even ever want to call them because, you know, who wants to sit and listen to the phone ring? Um, that's a really, really, you know, it, that that example seems to really resonate with folks. Like, you know, imagine trying to make a date with somebody and they they don't have voicemail or call waiting. You just have to hope that they're home, you know, when you call. That's now an essential feature. So keep in mind, right? Things that um, today might be considered, you know, nice to have in a few years might become essential, and you don't want to be behind the curve. You you want to be aware of of what the customers and the vendors are seeing and how you can enhance your own experiences with it. Yeah, I think Terrence hit all the high notes on that one. I think, you know, the takeaway is that digital expectations are changing and, you know, everyone is looking at the consumer world and their everyday life. And when they then turn to do a, a lease application or log into a vendor portal, they, they can find it lacking because it's not the same um, because it, it might be a little bit behind. And so how can we take some of those table stakes that Terrence was talking about um, and bring them into the experience? How can we um, take the information that we already know either about the customer or about the dealer uh, or vendor and bring it in to the application, to the portal, to the um, self-serve capabilities so that it, it might not be a like for like when you look at consumer versus commercial, but it's starting to get closer and closer to parity. Um, and then you're meeting your, your vendor's expectations and in hopefully many cases, um, delighting them. And so really it's about that um, simplest, it's the simple things, right? It's the form fill, um, it's the grabbing addresses, it's um, things like a great search that we talked about earlier. Um, but really when you look at that everyday life um, and, and pull that in, that's where you're gonna start to see those small wins and the small wins are what uh, turn into the really great ones. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to be talking about like what do you see when you're at home, like checking your bank website or whatever, and then you go to work and it's like, this is, this is not what I was expecting to see. I want, I want the same stuff here. Right. It's, it's hard to get ahead of that as, as, a, as a lender. Anyway. Some of these, you know, these changes take time to get put in place. Our, our, our takeaway from that, just the first one that we did was like the cold thing, and Terrence mentioned this a couple times, but just being able to like do something interesting with quotes instead of just like a nice little or form with a calculator, like having something that's a little bit more intuitive and, you know, we've got some sliders on there like you'd see on your bank website to kind of adjust what's there, but being able to get multiple options, like you said, Terrence, is it is a nice feature to have and being able to select and have it be sort of a modern user interface and as a lender being able to enable these for the vendors pre-setting them up in advance and saying here's all the options you guys are going to have you can do whatever you want within these options and you can adjust your margin adjust your residuals based on you know however you guys have your vendor program set up but then having them with that sort of access calculating that on the fly giving them options and then even providing the ability of like, here, we can enable some documentation for you as well too. You can share this with your customer. They can take it home with them or you can you know, initiate your application directly from there. Like you mentioned earlier, Terrence, or well, being able to create a cold from an app. Just features that are like, I feel like I should be able to click a button here and, make me, and do the next thing. Like adding those sort of things to your systems is something that's gonna become table stakes now, as you mentioned, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, the other, so we talked about like this minimum viable product and then sharing that with your vendors, bringing it back to the conversation and saying like, here's what you said and here's what I heard from that. And this is what it looks like now. We've had some interesting experiences with that. And we, you know, we did the vendor interviews like you guys did. And then we shared them with other vendors and then other industry experts. And they said, wow, that is an awesome feature. That is not what I thought you meant by that when it's when, when I read the label for that. So we've done some things like having to go through and 
like rename the labels, rename the sections, just so that it's, you know, taking that feedback and saying it wasn't intuitive like I thought it was going to be. Let's put, let's build that into the system. What kind of experiences did you guys have with that in terms of like getting your feedback and why is it important to do that? Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's important for many reasons. Um, first of all, being that I find that, you know, customers, whether they're, they're end customers or vendors, they never use the product in the way you think they're going to. And so getting an opportunity to work with them to see how they're using the product and get their direct feedback is absolute necessity because, um, you know, while we might think it's the most intuitive label or we might think that um, the process is smooth and efficient, if we don't know their, their day in and day out and how they interact with the solution, then we're probably going to get it wrong most of the time. Um, and so that's why it's really key to have some sort of feedback loop. But it's also really helping to solidify your relationship with your vendors. And it's creating that repeatable process that really helps to um, solidify your position in the market um, to do well against your competitors. You know, we've found quite a bit with even um, showing screens and working with a, a customer and they said, well, can we change this one field because everyone else we do business with has it this, you know, it's a percentage versus a point. And, and we had no idea. And so we we could quickly made an adjustment so that we weren't the, the ones that did it different. Um, you know, it, it's small things like that that's going to help you to build your better relationships. And it quite frankly, we've used it as a part to talk with prospects. Um, we've used it to get feedback, not only from our customers, but people we want to do business with as well. And, and it's been a helpful tool to really solidify that we cement our relationships, that we are working with our vendors to try and create a better experience for them. And that we will, um, we have a process that is, is tested and, and true that we will come back to them and take advantage of everything they've told us um, for their benefit and ours. There's not a lot I could add to that. That was an <laughs> excellent summary. I will say the the way to know that you're working with real professionals in the project management department though, is when you tell them you want to do feedback, additional feedback cycles to feedback into development. And they say, okay, let's leave a little time to make some changes mm -hmm. if we learn something really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, that's something to consider. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of time. Sometimes it's just a copy change or a field label or a quick calculation. Um, small things can make a big difference. But if you're gonna do the research, make sure you leave some time to do something with the cool stuff you learn. Right. Right. To Melissa's point, it shows that you value their input, right? So if you you went out and asked them originally, what do you guys think? How do you want this to work? Right. And then you did something with it. And then you came back and asked him, is this, is this what you really wanted? Like, that's just a, a good way to like almost surprise and delight your customers. Because everybody likes feeling like my input is valued. You took what I, you listened to what I said, you tried to do it, and then you're willing to change again. And I think that's important. Right. Oh, we're on to question and answer already. So I did get one question. So um, as Chelsea had said, let's, if you have other questions, let us know and put them into the chat. The one question we did get so far was uh, SMS and email. Okay, so for the notifications, the right now it's enabled for email and SMS, but the SMS is um, it's component driven. So the notifications could go out via any service. So yeah, WhatsApp could be an option for that if that was something that you were interested in. Just give it a minute here to see if anybody else has any other questions. Yeah. Well, no questions yet, but I, I do have one for you guys, something that we've talked about as we've been you know, communicating about this. What, what would it take for somebody so if somebody was brand new to wanting to do something like this then like i want to i want to do i want to enhance my digital experience like what kind of tools do you need or is it you know how did how does somebody go about it and terence you've had some good in, in input on like quick and easy ways of starting and listening to so 
either one of you? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the short answer is you can hire a director of user experience and staff up the department and turn them loose. Um, if you uh, want to take a smaller step, um, there's there's nothing that excludes a energetic, curious person from doing really, really good work on their own. Um, user experience um, processes and best practices are all over the web. You know how to interview, um, how to you know how to how to make a user journey and figure out where the trouble spots are. Um, the tools that we use, you know, as professionals can be specialized, but they don't have to be. Um, you don't need uh, high-level prototyping capabilities. You can make wireframes in PowerPoint. Um, paper prototypes can get you a tremendous amount of really, really valuable feedback. You don't necessarily need a fancy uh, user research facility. Um, we've done fantastic work and gotten terrific results with WebEx. Um, you record the session. Uh, you can watch it again. Um, you know, we can, we've done usability testing with WebEx where we, we put up the PowerPoint and then give mouse and keyboard to control uh, to the participant and they can figure out how to create a quote or how to send a, uh, an email to a, to a customer or whatever using the prototype system that we've built for them. So there's a ton of ways where you can get valuable, useful, interesting feedback on small features or large fun fundamental foundational issues without you know, having to make a huge investment up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I would add to, you know, you could start with your internal teams that, that are customer facing. So talk with the sales team, talk with relationship managers, um, with the support teams that are interacting with your, your vendors day in and day out. Um, they're going to be a, a wealth of information of what they've been hearing um, at, out on the street as well as get you connected into the customers that are going to be able to share that feedback with you um, and bring them along. Have them join you if they're able because everyone is gonna learn something from these interviews and this type of process. Um, and I haven't met a, a salesperson that's told me, no, we can't go talk to a customer. And they love nothing more than an opportunity to have another touch point with their customer and especially to create something sticky. Um, to create another opportunity where they're showcasing how, uh, you know, we are the better provider and, and here's why we care about you, we value about, value your opinion. So um, I, I'd start there um, and, and then spread out um, and using some of the simple tools that Terrence mentioned all the way up to uh, the more complex uh, user experience type of, of activity and tools as well. Yeah, I agree. Like, I like to start small when I'm testing something out too, like give it a, give it a little test, see how it goes and, and build from there. Mm -hmm. We did get a couple of questions here. So one of the questions was, do I have to give you access to my Salesforce? So uh, you, you gathered that it's built on Salesforce as a platform, that, that's correct. And no, you don't have to give us access to it. It can be, it, the platform is Salesforce, but you do not need Salesforce in order to do it. It's a, uh, um, you can use it on top of any other platform and it can, you know, integrate to your Salesforce platform or to any other originations or servicing system. Next question was, is it multi-currency and multi-language capabilities? Uh, again, it's built on Salesforce. So that's all inherent within the Salesforce platform. So yes, you would be able to do that. Next question, while I understand you provide out of the box products, do you offer general consultation uh, for custom solutions? Dep it depends on the, on the, on the scenario. Um, yeah, more than likely we, we probably would, but we, we do work in the um, equipment finance space and we do do you know, Salesforce solutions, but feel free to reach out. Oh, this, is, this is a general question for everybody. What did we find most surprising in the process of doing these interviews and then like taking them, taking them forward? Terrence, do you want to start or you want me to? <laughs> most surprising. So I, I think um, one of the things that um, we were surprised by was the extent to which we saw um, the um the proxy swivel happening um that was that was one of those things that 
um, you know, really shone a light into how um, access to data um, can, you know, has these cascading ripple effects when it's when it's not there that that um, that ripple out from like across enterprises to vendors to clients. So that kind of thing um, can be not just the, the fact that it exists, but but how widespread the effects were um, was a was a big surprise to us, I think. Um, and um, I think uh, we were also, I think, um, pleasantly surprised by um, how creative the uh, the frontline staff were in solving problems when they came up. Um, your, I just kind of reiterates a point that Melissa made, but um, ask people not just what the problems are, but how they get around them. They're, um, the, the folks at, uh, that I interviewed, the, the CIT staff is, is, is seasoned and well experienced, and um, they have figured out workarounds for a lot of stuff. So uh, they're, they're you know, impressive folks just in the, in, just off the bat, but also um, their ability to not just report the problem but contribute to the solution is is very valuable. Yeah, I think um, to piggyback on that one with Terrence, what he was saying, I think uh, it's not just having them tell you what they do, having them show you what they do, I know it will uncover a lot of additional questions um, because I think for me the biggest surprise is when you watch people. Um, navigate, whether it's they're navigating their own internal systems and, and you're walking through processes to try to understand better, or when you're giving a prototype to a, a customer, a vendor, and asking them to step by step as you're, you know, on a, on a WebEx with them and they're walking through, um, and then they're asking, you know, giving live feedback and, and you have to wonder, well, why did they do that that way? And and then, or they're asking questions of, of you say, you know, why did you name it like this? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, I thought that was really clear. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, you know, or they, they don't understand the step-by-step -step process because it's not laid out in a way that makes sense to them. Whereas I thought it was perfectly clear. And so, um, you know, I said it earlier and I, I stand by it every time, you know, you put something out out and they'll always use it differently than what you expected them to. And so being able to understand that a little bit earlier in the process, you know, in, especially before you launch something really helps because I'm always surprised by, by the way in which they either use something or the questions they have um, or, you know, they may not have understood something that I thought was perfectly clear. And so it's just a, another level of um, an understanding what they're going through day to day to try to get their transactions through. Yeah, for, for me, we had, we had a little different perspective, right? Because we were interviewing sort of our customers, customers, and then our customers to, to see what was interesting to them. And the there was portals that were out there. So people did have portals and, the, and I think it was interesting to see that they, they had a choice, like the vendors had a choice and they had an opinion on every single one. They're like, I like this one for this. So then I wrote that down. And then I don't like this one for this. And then I wrote that down of like, all right, don't do that. But mm -hmm. it was, they still used them all for the most part, but you could tell that there was a preference. Like I would rather send stuff here or rather send stuff there. So that, that was pretty interesting. Right, I, I always ask, what do you like and what do you hate? Um, because you can action on both of those things. Right, yeah, and I guess I learned the same thing that you guys did too. Everybody was very happy to tell you, like, I will tell you everything you want to know, mm -hmm. give you all the information you need because they know that that benefits them. So they're, like Melissa said earlier, like it's, people will be happy to talk to you. Yep, and sometimes yeah, in, you give people in, that don't want to say anything, like they, they're afraid they're going to offend you. Um, and so it, you have to kind of get over that too. Um, <laughs> and it's okay to say bad things because I can fix that. <laughs> Yeah, we always tell people we don't report feedback with names attached to it. And, you know, as, as I always say, I didn't design any of this. So if you hate it, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, and the truth is that um, a lot of people have sort of said, well, I hate this thing in particular, and you can tell them I said so. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I've got a, a bunch more questions too. Thank you for oh, all the good. questions. This is good. Um, so this one is, how often do you recommend upgrading the portal? I guess my, my opinion on that may, may differ from you guys is because I, I obviously want people to upgrade it. But to me, like what we were talking about earlier of like trying to stay ahead of the game. So it, it and maybe if you're talking about a core platform upgrade, like, you know, stay in the release cycle of your software provider. But if you're talking about enhancing features, like try to stay ahead of the game is my, my opinion on that. Like try to try to see what's new and exciting that's out there that's going to become table stakes later and, and have that so that you're not having somebody tell you, so everybody else does this, why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's where communication is key because I think you don't wanna bombard your your users with continual upgrades and updates um, constantly. So they, if things are continuing to change and they can't um, you know, easily do their, their job and get the transactions and sometimes that can be more distracting than it is helpful. Um, so it really is a balance in making sure that you're providing valuable updates, um, but in a timely manner to uh, which works for your vendors and your customers. All right, next, my next question is, what data sources slash API are available for KYB with, and what data sources for sole proprietors in particular? So I'm taking that as know your customer and all the business you're doing business with. Um, I would say, um we we work with a couple of different companies for that and there's a couple of different cool and exciting technologies coming out for that that are that are out there in the industry too so like ofac integration with a company called easy ofac um middesk is a company that provides um secretary of state searches to, to you know to understand the business and who the owners of the business are um so there's an integration for that and then on the like the the cool technologies for that there's a couple of different companies that do um, like ID verification, so taking an image of your ID and verifying that with the information that's on there, and then they can also like match that to selfies, so you know prevent fraud there, which is pretty cool. Um, there's another company that does um, we will have an API for it, that will just verify your identity based on like email address, phone number, taking a bunch of different variables and giving you a fraud risk indicator based on those. So those are a couple of uh, different options that are out there. I don't know. Do you guys have any inputs on? Those are I mean, yep. yeah, those are great ideology. Are we allowed to say company names? Yeah, <laughs> I, ideology does a great ID verification. Yodely does bank verification. For, one of the big fraud vectors is is forged bank statements. If you're getting them right from the bank's API using a service like Yodely, you know you you kind of close off that avenue pretty well. Uh, LexisNexis has a product. I don't know if you're a rich sole proprietor or um, that would help because some of these things do come with a, a service fee. Um, I would say ideology is not really is an enterprise tool. It's not for the sole provider, but you know, LexisNexis, Dun and Bradstreet. Um, yeah. Check the SOS websites. There's a um, there's a site out there that has all of the Secretary of State um, websites linked to it, so you can go and check and see if somebody has a you know is a re is a real business as far as their Secretary of State is con concerned. Yeah, and there's a there's a service that'll do all Secretary of State's for as a new sorry, yeah. new company out of Southern California. But that's yeah, that's a good one. Um and there's also like other like these technology companies that'll do the the digital, the machine learning, the, the AI stuff on all of those that'll do that work for you and let the computers do the thinking. Uh let's see, make sure I didn't miss one here. There's one more. Yeah, let's see. Any suggestions on what feedback tools to use? to share the experience digitally. We we tend to do, you know, WebExes like this or Zoom or whatever whatever your tool is, and then demonstrations is, is what we'll do. And then just, we've discussed as a group, like some of the other ways, if you're designing your own thing, like if you show a finished product, you're gonna get less feedback. You're gonna get like, I wanna be nice, this person did this, you know, they spent a lot of hours on it. If you show a rough product and there's tools to make it show a rough product, or you you know hand sketch, whiteboard, those sort of things, you're going to get more honest feedback. So that's just some advice there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've done that. We've done both of those things where we start out with small, start out with sketches, start out with um, rough drafts, and then all the way into prototypes where they take over um, via WebEx, and then they are driving 
um, you know, we send the URL, they log in um, just to get that entire end-to-end -end experience. And then they're just providing commentary. The, their purpose um, on the call is to, to log in and tell us everything. And um, when you're creating that relationship and they know that it's okay to be able to say whatever they want, you know, that's where you can still get really great feedback as they're walking through step-by-step -step too. We've had success both ways. Any other inputs on that, Terrence? All good. I think you guys really cover the, the waterfront there. Um, I think that's the last of the questions. Any, any other input or questions? Elsie, did you have slides at the end you wanted to? I hit? did. I was gonna. I didn't want to interrupt. So, if you can please move to the next slide. There should be excellent. Um, I'd like to thank North Tech and our panelists for this excellent webinar. I'd also like to thank our attendees. I hope you found a few helpful takeaways. You will receive a survey after the session ends, and I'd appreciate it if you take a moment to fill it out and let us know your thoughts on today's webinar. Please be sure to join us next week for ELFA's Wednesday webinar, The Future of Remote Work, presented by the Service Provider Business Council Steering Committee. Registration is available on our website. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Melissa and Terrence, for joining and participating in this. And thanks, everybody, for joining the call. Thank thanks you so much. much. Have a great day. Excellent. Thanks. Bye. You guys do the same.